Dr. Vanithi for this uh, very interesting session on integrating dry eye into clinical practice. Thank you, Dr. Numrata. I think we will start right away so that we have more time for uh, some interesting discussions in between and at the end. So I will invite uh, Dr. Vishal Arola to talk to us on uh, setting up of a dry eye clinic. Thank you, Dr. Vanati. Uh, thank you, ma'am, and thank you uh, to the panelists uh, uh, that are there. Uh, the steam panelists, my teachers, everybody here is my teacher here. And I will be starting this topic uh, uh, by a very basic uh, thing that how to set up your own dry eye clinic. And why do you need a dry eye clinic per se? So when we look at the burden of dry eye disease, and we don't have to go further, let's look at our newspapers only. So newspapers have said that yes, India is in the of dry eye disease and uh, epidemic. And if we uh, look at uh, uh, the 2019 study done by people uh, who had the journalists, they said that India sees dry eye disease as an emerging threat. When you look at the scientific data study from RP Center in 2018, where uh, we astoundingly we found 32 percent of it's the prevalence. Uh, of dry eye in uh, uh, patients aged between 21 to 40 years of age. India is predominantly a young population and 32%, that means 32 of 100 uh, individuals between 21 and 40 have dry eye and which is actually associated mostly with increased video display terminal or increased screen time. Now the next... Shall I continue? So the next question is, why should you designate a separate space for dry eye? So let me ask a simple question. So how many patients of dry eye do you actually see? And how many patients uh, do require lubricants? And if you are a cataract and an ASIC surgeon, how, what are the drops that you are giving uh, to the patients most commonly after LASIK or cataract surgery? So our answer is pretty clear here. So also, if one looks at dry eye, it's not that simple. So it requires increased chair time and so it's, it's, it's lots of diagnostics are there. At times, the chair time is more than uh, required for uh, doing a cataract surgery counseling or a LASIK counseling. If still not uh, uh, convinced that you should uh, designate a, a space for dry eye, you look at this chart from the DUCE2, uh, which says that dry eye is so multifactorial that so many things affect the ocular surface. You can have MGD, blepharitis, uh, vitamin A deficiency, ocular aller allergies, surgery, contact lens wear, whatever you're eating, systemic drugs, lacrimal obstruction, autoimmune diseases, and there's so many things. Then aging, everybody's gonna age, you cannot reverse that. So I, I think I'm pretty clear here that yes, we should designate some form of the other uh, special time uh, to uh, managing dry eye, whether it's you call it a dry eye clinic or an ocular surface clinic or whatever, but you have to uh, give it more time and it requires more time. So how do we set up a dry eye clinic? So uh, I am going to base it on the uh, uh, published literature, which is mostly acceptable. So the DUCE2 is mostly acceptable study that we have here. So our approach should be simple. We have to start asking the right questions, look at the risk factor analysis, do proper diagnostic tests, diagnose which type of dry eye primarily the patient has, whether it's an evaporative or an aqueous deficiency dry eye, or it's a mixed type of dry eye, which most people do have. Then treat them accordingly. So first and foremost, should question should be whether you should take the, this person that has come into your dry eye clinic. So you have to ask simple questions that, whether uh, the discomfort that he's having with how severe it is. Is it associated with any mouth dryness or glands enlargement? And how long his symptoms have lasted and what was the triggering event? Is the vision affected? Do you have blurred vision? And does it clear on blinking? Do you suffer Haji. from redness? And if yes, what time of the day it is worse? Is there any itching or the eyes are swollen, crusty? Or is there any discharge? 
are you a contact lens user have you been diagnosed with other uh, general health conditions or not and if you have been whether you are taking any medications so you'll have a fair idea yes this 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 person can have dry eye and now you suspect that the patient uh, has dry eye now you will ask specific questions and do a risk factor analysis so in the risk factor analysis do you to also uh, found that there are certain risk factors mm -hmm. which are modifiable and non modifiable in that we can always uh, uh, have risk factors which are consistently associated with dry eye yes. which are probably associated with dry eye and which are inconclusively associated with dry eye so consistently you'll have a few patients uh, uh, female patients uh, aging patients would have more of dry eye than modifiable uh, factors uh, which are actually associated with increased dry eye compute people having more computer use increased contact lens wear people on hormonal replacement therapy patient using systemic medications or ocular medication like antihistaminic antidepressants anxiolytics or tretinoin even retinoin creams probable is important because it is the, the still they say that yes this is a contributory to dry eye like diabetes rosacea thyroid eye disease uh, any kind of refractive surgery trigem because of the uh, poor ocular surface next important part is that the evidence is still inconclusive for we we have been saying that menopause will lead to dry eye and so many things but the evidence is still inconclusive inconclusive in patients Uh, if you look at the association between menopause uh, sarcoidosis smoking pregnancies pregnancy or alcohol so you have to do a thorough risk analysis before going to the next step the next steps are the major steps here the, the, they include uh, doing a screening uh, administering a screening uh, questionnaire the type of questionnaire i let you know in the next uh, uh, slides then what type of diagnostics should we employ and then our diagnostics and screening and our uh, whatever we do with the patient has to be coupled with the treatment and the uh, supported by the pharmacy that we have so these are the basic components of dry uh, eye so let's come to the first part here that uh, how do we screen so screening is uh, done by giving uh, administering a questionnaire questionnaire can be uh, different type of questionnaires i am most commonly using the ocular surface disease index or the and the speed questionnaire uh, you can also use the dry eye questionnaire these questionnaires will always give you a score and on the basis of scoring you will be able to assess whether what in what category the patient that has come to you is there on the basis of subjective assessment so we let's look at the osdi uh, in, uh, in a little detail so osdi is uh, divided into three zones here So the first zone uh, uh, has questions pertaining to ocular symptoms. The second has vision-related functions, and the third is the environmental factors how they are affecting the dry eye. Each response is graded as zero to four. Zero means that it is not there. Four means that the symptom or the, the the problem is persistent all the time. So we calculate the OSDI score or uh, by adding the uh, subset questions. and dividing it by uh, the number of question the patient answers into 25 and we get a score a score more than 13 indicate the patient has uh, some or the other degree of dry eye disease if you want to uh, go into more details or if you want to uh, do a subjective screening on the basis of only osdi you can categorize him as mild dry eye between 13 and 22 moderate dry eye between 23 and 32 and more than 32 as severe dry eye you can always use these this questionnaire as a follow up method also that how are the symptoms how is the how is the uh, subjective assessment faring after your treatment whole funda of doing a dry eye diagnostic is to either designate a person into an aqueous dry eye or a uh, evaporative dry eye or something in between and there are various tests involved in doing all this so let's look at the first the clinical test that we can do commonly The first is the Schirmer's test. Schirmer's test, you all know, we are utilizing a filter paper strip, which is bent and put in the lower fornix. You can check uh, the basal and stimulated secretion by uh, putting a drop of anesthetic or without anesthesia. Usually, a normal value is said to be more than 15 millimeters of wetting at five minutes. Then 
the simple assessment of uh, uh, how the tear film is staying on the eye is by the tear film breakup time or uh, or uh, using the fluorescein dye you just instill fluorescein uh, uh, with the flu uh, fluorescein strip uh, in the furnace and uh, you tell the patient to blink uh, thrice then after the last blink tell him to just keep the eyes open the time taken for the first dry spot to appear after blink is noted to improve your uh, repeat uh, to improve the uh, what you say uh, uh, that whether you are uh, to near the true value of the tear film break up time you can use multi three uh, uh, readings and do an averaging out of those three readings third clinical assessment very important is doing for the lids so lids clinical assessment is not just that simple as you can see the chart here so it has a classification uh, and grading system which looks at the eyelid margin the sorry faces the ducts and the sni and the express secretions so after looking at the upper lid and lower lid after looking at the expressibility that how how easy it was how is the is there keratinization are there normal blood vessels you you will come out to a, with a scoring criteria and you can know clinically only that whether the mevobin glands have been affected or not this is another test which is uh, uh, not commonly done uh, in uh, in india uh, as far as i know when i was there at rpc and I, i i did not do it which is called the phenol red test and it is a, a less invasive test than your uh, uh, schirmer's test in assessing uh, the tear volume here a cot thin cotton thread which is impregnated with the phenol red is put in the lower fornix and as the tears start to flow the tears will wet this thread and leading to a color change we look at the color change uh, after 15 seconds a color change at the length of more than 10 mm indicates that the patient is has a normal uh, tear volume and less than 10 mm of uh, uh, staining indicates that that this is this, the patient has a dry eye now ocular surface staining uh, is has been given a lot of importance in the tube to classification where it is Uh, an additional criteria uh, to be used along with the screening so what we do in ocular surface uh, staining is we look at the staining pattern of the cornea and the conjunctiva and the lids so lids are uh, uh, important here in the cornea we look at punctate spots if there are more than point, uh, five punctate spots in the cornea that means yes it's a significant uh, uh, dry eye you look at uh, conjunctival spots with the lysamine green if they are confluent or they are Uh, uh what we say uh, multiple spots then we look at the lid margins so lid margin staining if it is more than 2 mm in length this is the length and more than 25% in width then it indicates yes the ocular surface is getting bad and yes this is a, there is a, a clinical dry eye now you, people would say why now we have assessed the test that i have described you would say that we can uh, wrap up the diagnostics here only but it is not the case so why do we need neuro diagnostics because we need to get over the poor repeatability of the older methods we have to improve the objectivity and we have to make the test less operator dependent so that it's not always the clinician who is looking at the patient for doing these tests and we have to make our test less invasive no touch technique let's come to first test which has been recommended by the dus2 which say is that we should measure the uh, the tear film break up time using non invasive methods or which is called a nit bar as it is shown to have a superior discriminative ability in detecting dry eye as compared to as done with fluorescein because fluorescein it is said that can lead to uh, uh, destabilizing it can lead to destabilizing effect on the tear film itself now how do we do uh, nit bar is it's just a, uh, a camera which is taking a continuous image of the eye Of, uh, on the eye on the tear film actually we have projected a placebo disc we ask the patient to blink and and then we ask the patient uh, after the last blink to keep his eyes open we look for any distortions or discontinuities that are reflected in the image of the placebo disc pattern and you take an average of these three readings and you will get a non invasive tear film break up time the second automated uh, 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 assessment is uh, measuring the tear film osmolarity why is this is important because it is known to induce apoptosis 
and uh, serve as a pro-inflammatory stress, and it will reduce the ability of mucin-like molecules to lubricate the ocular surface. There are currently two types of uh, 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 osmolarity measuring devices. Both are handheld. One is the iPen, which uh, has a filter paper-like uh, uh, protrusion that that collects the tears, and then uh, other is a tear layer osmolated as a capillary action that around 100 nanoliter. Uh, uh, TS goes into the, the machine to give us an analysis of the uh, osmolarity. So any osmolarity value above 308 milliosmoles per kg is considered as abnormal. And inter-eye difference of more than eight is considered as abnormal. Mind you, these, these two devices do suffer from poor repeatability. Next automated assessment, assessment is of tear volume. We did the phenol red thread we had, where we had to uh, do put a uh, phenol red uh, thread into the eye. Let's not put anything into the eye and we can have an anterior segment OCT look at it. We just focus the anterior segment OCT at the lid margin where the lid is touching the cornea and we look at the tear meniscus height. As it is a good indicator of uh, uh, what is the quality and what is the quantity of, sorry, quantity of the tear film. A uh, tear fill, tear meniscal height less than 0.2 millimeters indicates there is less uh, quantity of tears. You can also do this manually by clicking a high resolution picture of the same lower lid margin with the cornea and then measuring it manually. There are machines also that can uh, help you do that. The lipid uh, quality can also be measured using interferometry. So what happens in interferometry is that the light passes through the tear film and the reflections are uh, uh, put, uh, taken up by the camera. The reflections are uh, uh, from that are, that are taken back by the camera, they form an interference pattern. The interference pattern is uh, analyzed and, uh, uh, and is, 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 is projected as colors in the final image. So the colors, the more colors we have, the better thickness of the uh, uh, lipid layer that we have. Uh, there are various machines that can do it, but originally it was the uh, Lippy view system that was doing the uh, interferometric color assessment. And, and uh, they were measuring the interferometric color units. Uh, and for example, an idea would be a uh, value of above 65, it should be taken as a good, uh, value for an interferometric color assessment and uh, less than uh, 65 meant that the patient has uh, uh, the lipid layer is not that stable. Then comes the objective assessment of your mebobin glands. So mebography uh, is basically visualization of your mebobin glands. We are able to know whether they are swollen, whether they are, uh, the, the, what is the, their branching, whether they are regular, they are straight, or whether there have been loss of mebobin glands. There are various scale available. The scale that I've given here is by Arita et al. Uh, where they have measured it uh, uh, in three grades with zero as no loss. Uh, grade one, 33% uh, of the total area. Grade two as 33 to 67%. And grade three as 67% uh, loss. Now, we have measured everything here. Ultimately, we have to treat. I think the treatment part, uh, Dr. Rishi and uh, Dr. Piyush are going to uh, take forward. In this specific treatment, I would be uh, telling you about uh, uh, physical heating devices and expression devices like the Epiflow or uh, uh, stimulatory devices like the Intense Pulse Slide. So there, these are the devices that uh, claim that they are able to stimulate the glands, decrease the abnormal blood vessels, and lead to uh, more expressibility of these glands and leading to ultimately less of dry eye. So what happens in intense pulse light is that it's, it's, it's an intense light of a broad wavelength from 590 to 1200 nanometer with increased energy, uh, increased, increased energy. This energy is being taken up by these small blood vessels, uh, oxygen, hemoglobin and leads to thrombosis of these small blood vessels or rosacea type blood vessels that can say. Also, this is the heat is locally absorbed. This local absorption of heat induces melting of the secretions of the mucin glands and hence 
leads to opening of these glands. Mind you, one more thing that I would like to tell you is that uh, we cannot do IPL for the upper. We can only do this for the lower head. This is a small video uh, representing that how we do it. So uh, yes. So this is basically the uh, module which is going to give a broad uh, beam light. You can have it with the gel or without the gel. There are various equipments to do the same. So uh, here we are doing it without the gel where the, the pulses are being applied over the lower lid area and along the temple. So this is a pre pretty simple method. It has to be followed by uh, our uh, uh, treatment with lubricants and anti-inflammatory treatment. Next comes the lippy flow where uh, the, uh, the, 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 the device is able to heat and put pressure on the glands simultaneously. The, this used to be very expensive, expensive earlier, now it has reduced uh, its cost also. But basically the idea is to give pressure to the glands and heat these glands. There is no stimulatory effect there, there is no thrombosis of blood vessels. So, so you can say that the recurrence post uh, uh, the, the, this procedure could be uh, uh, early as compared to uh, uh, when we compare it to the IPL. Now, as we are advancing, we don't need uh, so heavy equipments. Uh, this is uh, an instrument called ILUX, which is able to grab the lid uh, uh, between it, between the, uh, the, the forceps like uh, projection, and it is able to heat the lid uh, to a desired level and then pressurize it also to uh, express it out. You can also be able to visualize this real time by looking at your, uh, uh, looking at looking through the magnifying glass that the device has. So all in all, when you set up a dry eye clinic, there are certain must-haves. Must-haves is that you have, should have a drain screening questionnaire. You should be able to do uh, the uh, TFM breakup time fluorescein using the fluorescein, two accurate tumors, ocular staining scoring. You should know about mevomin gland clinical and express secretion degrading. If you can do mevography, you can utilize your AI. You don't need a standalone machines for that or any infrared camera for that matter. And yes, you should have a lot of chair time because that is the most important part. What is desirable is having all the advanced automated diagnosis because this will decrease the time the clinician spends on assessment. You can have treatment devices. Uh, I have given a few. Today, you can have many more. This is a never ending topic. Osmolarity direction is desirable because it is a part of the DUS2 classification. You can have the Mibon gland standalone devices for Mibon gland imaging. To summarize, uh, in, if we look at dry eye disease, it's a significant uh, part of practice and prevalence and requires a lot of chair time. And the patients do need careful evaluation. When we look at a dry eye disease, screenings and diagnostics are the mainstay. Treatment can be based on clinical or equipment uh, based. Equipment because owning, owning is expensive. It is better if you don't have equipment, find a friend who, can, who has the equipment and get your patients done there. Remember, you cannot treat all. Even if you have all the gadgetry, you will not be having all patients who would be uh, happy with your treatment and hence invest wisely. There are other aspects like blood tests, like you can have uh, vitamin D testing, B12 testing, and so many other things which I have not touched here because I was just giving you an overview of the dry eye setting up of a dry eye clinic and all the best for your dry eye clinic thank you so much thank you Vishal for a comprehensive coverage on uh, what all one would need when uh, you would uh, be setting up a dry eye clinic so as and when uh, questions are just coming up I would like to ask um, uh, uh, ask Dr. Tityal and Dr. Ritu uh, what basically would you suggest as as uh, a person who's starting a diet clinic should be having, Dr. Jitial? Yeah, thank you, Manati. Uh, very nice uh, beginning of this session by Dr. Vishal. I think whenever we're looking for dry eye clinic setup, there are three basic areas to be looked into. The first is, you know, uh, as you said, screening area. That is basically a patient interview area. There should be an educational uh, matter for him, which may be on papers or a booklets. 
or some sort of uh, uh, screen which gives you information on, on dry eye things. That that's a basic area which is going to take a lot of time. So you require a, a, a person which may be optometrist or a, your resident who can you know interview and screen the patients. According to that, you can decide what type of investigation has to be done. The second area is investigative area. So there are two or three components of investigative area which he highlighted. One is a slit lamp based investigation. We are going to examine the patient, maybe a BUT, Sharmas will come into that. Then you have an equipment based investigation, which are basically a tear osmolality or a doing a, a lippy scan type of thing or a topography to look into a, you know, a, a non invasive BUT or a, a, your meniscus height. A third area, which is most important, will be a physician area or a, we, we call it a treatment area, where a patient can be ultimately diagnosed the label of dryness, type of dryness and give a treatment uh, possible, where we are going to do a, a lippy flow type of treatment or a thermo uh, treatment for these patients or a uh, intensive pulse therapy for these cases and give a counseling same time. And this is how you're going to set up your clinic in a three different areas, which is managed by a three different types of uh, technical experts in that area, which will ultimately make a comprehensive clinic for a subsequent treatment. Thank you, sir. And uh, Dr. Ritu, what would you suggest uh, or what do you feel about all the latest equipments which are now being uh, incorporated into a dry eye clinic? She has to put an audio on. Uh, yeah. No. yeah. See, A, I just want to look at it, the kind of practice which one has and the kind of dry eye patients which we are getting, you know, because dry eye is multifactorial in etiology. So depending upon the kind of dry eye patients we are having, our clinic should be based according to that. And it also varies whether you vary in a government setup, in a private setup, and overall patients which we are, one is encountering. And yes, it's very nice to have this latest gadgetry because uh, it really takes care of the myobin gland disease uh, very, very effectively, for which um, none of the conservative measures, other things have actually been working. So if one can afford and uh, you know, price is not an issue, sure, one should have those uh, newer you know, diagnostic and treatment modalities incorporated in the clinic to look up you know, and to treat these recalcitrant cases, actually. So your consensus would be that for uh, a routine management of dry eye diseases, the current office setup largely suffices, but when we are probably dealing with uh, refractive cases of dry eye or the special types of dry eye is when the application of these diagnostics and their uh, treatment modalities will probably yes. play a role. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, anything so else? I, I, yes, I understand, Vanati, because yes. dry eye is a disease which is, you know, not going to come to the specialized people most often, you know. They are yes, going sir. to go to general ophthalmologist as such. Yes, sir. And you rightly pointed out and Vishal nicely depicted also, they can be immediately diagnosed as on a symptom base, on a patient presentation base, and a minor test like a BOT Sharma's can give you, you know, the label of dryness. And you don't require a very high setup for uh, diagnosing these type of dryness. I think the common ophthalmologists can diagnose these cases effectively and treat them. And only for a specialized area, we, we can have these gadgets. I think now, sir, shall we move on to the next talk? And before yes, we yes. take further discussion, yes, yes. so over to Dr. Rishi Mohan to talk to us on the role of inflammation and hyperosmolarity in dry eye, how to counter. Dr. Rishi uh, One minute, uh, Dr. Vanati. Yes, Dr. Subhash has joined late. Oh, okay. So yeah. you want to introduce before Dr. Rishi starts speaking. Yes, sir. Um, Dr. Subhash, uh, would you like to say a few words? Subhash has just taken over as the DOS president for this year. We welcome you, Dr. Subhash, on this first webinar after taking over. And uh, we would be happy to hear from you now. Unmute, 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 Subhash. Subhash, unmute. Unmute. Uh, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, Hello, ma'am. How are you? Yeah. Everything yeah. is fine. Yes. Hi. Welcome, Hi, sir. Uh, you like to with with the session. Session. Yes. Okay. You can proceed with the session. It is your uh, domain. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Subhash. Over to Dr. Rishi right now. 
well thank you so much and uh, um can you see can you yes. see anything yes yes uh, on slide show sir yes not yet on slide show yeah is it on slide show uh, no not is yeah, yeah. now yeah. is it yeah. okay it is now okay so i think we had a nice introduction of how to set up the clinic and i'm going to talk about two very specific aspects as we go into the details of the discussion and i'm going to talk about hyperosmolarity and inflammation in dry eye and how to see if we can bring in some uh, counter measures to try and make things a little better for our patients so we know about the lacrimal functional unit it's now this is uh, these are now uh, almost 10 15 year old diagrams which comprises the ocular surface tissues the tear secreting glands and the cells and the secreto motor impulses related to the neural connections as well as the vicious circle of the dry eye disease so we know that there are four sentinel events that are there in this vicious circle of dry eye disease uh, and the two of them uh, being the ones that are relatively under our control one being hyperosmolarity and the other being inflammation and these are the two that we're going to be largely talking about today uh, we know that there is a host of uh, other things which are environmental and peripheral which impact this vicious circle and uh, make this whole thing become uh, uh, more active and and goes into a loop in that sense so hyperosmolarity and inflammation are the two areas that we can tackle we can't really deal with apoptosis very well because that's an intrinsic mechanism and the tear film instability actually is a derivative of hyperosmolarity and inflammation and this is all interlinked so in in dry eye and as vishal also mentioned uh 296 to 302 milliosmoles is the normal osmolarity of the tear film but in the dry eye this can go up to uh, fairly high levels uh anything more than 308 is suspicious uh, many workers consider 312 to be the cut off uh, for the most part uh, to be absolutely confirmatory it should be higher than 316 milliosmoles but you know the spikes on the uh, corneal surface are actually much higher than what we are able to pick up from uh, the tear meniscus or the conjunctival sac because the amount of fluid on the corneal surface is extremely low so uh, how does osmolarity really matter so we know what an isotonic state is when the extracellular fluid uh, and the intracellular fluid are in equilibrium or isoosmolar that means they contain the same amount of uh, water and solutes and the dehydrated or hyperosmolar state when in an hypotonic environment because of evaporative losses there is loss of water in the extracellular tear film and then that tends to suck out water from the epithelium so what happens to the epithelium it tends to shrink and as it tends to shrink uh, you can imagine uh, if all our corneal epithelial cells have started to shrink how can that how can that actually happen how can a tissue just shrink it can't so what does the dehydrated cell do the dehydrated cell starts to do what it calls a regulatory volume uh, intake exercise and it does this by bringing in salts and when it takes in salts it also brings in water and this then restores the cell volume but the problem with salt intake is that the uh the the electrolytes that it actually imbibes are sodium potassium magnesium the chlorides and the anions like bicarbonate and they interfere with the cell metabolism because there is hypernatremia and hyperkalemia intracellularly and this sets up an intrinsic apoptotic mechanism and there is cell damage and cell death so that's what starts to happen uh when there is this regulatory volume compensatory mechanism when we look at the timelines of how quickly this starts to set in one can see that on the first day itself following hyperosmolar stress there is an activation of the of the cascade and initially in the first week there is what we call acute epithelial disease which is derived and driven largely by the the chemical side of things by epithelial derived factors by cytokines chemokines and the mmps or the inflammatory markers and enzymes and only after the first week there is an induction of uh, bone marrow derived cells and t cell cytokines which start to come in because now there is what we call cell mediated uh, immune responses coming into play 
So this is how the ocular surface damage tends to happen. So how can we reverse the process and protect against hyperosmolarity? Let me take you back to the same animation where the normal cell uh, started to have water loss and became dehydrated and the salt intake happened, the regulatory volume increased and there was a, a, an apoptosis and death. But there is another mechanism that can be taken up and which is taken up in many cells in the body, which I'll talk about. And that is a regulatory volume intake by the intake of what we call compatible solutes. Now, compatible solutes essentially are non-ionic compounds which allow water to come in osmotically but do not interfere in the metabolism of the cell. So this is called osmoprotection. And these osmoprotectants can be taken up by cells which restore the cell volume and stabilize the protein function. So compatible solutes are non-ionic non organic compounds. They build inter intracellular osmotic strength, but they do not damage the proteins. And the cell function can then be maintained without damage under hyperosmotor conditions. Numerous tissues like the kidney, you can imagine the kidney, the heart, the brain, uh, they all experience hypertonicity and they all have the capacity to either synthesize uh, these uh, compatible solutes or import these compatible solutes. Um, the condyl epithelium, unfortunately, does not have the capacity to synthesize compatible solutes. And that's where the whole game of providing the ocular tear film with compatible solutes comes in. So there's an expanding pool of clinical data that suggests that there is a role of osmoprotectants. The osmoprotectant effect depends on how much the osmoprotectant the cell takes up and how long it is, it is retained. Glycerol and erythritol are small polyols. We've all heard of these. They are now all pretty standard uh, constituents of our drops, as is L-carnitine in some of our newer products. So the lab, as well as the clinical evidences, suggests that there is a benefit by uh, these processes. So uh, if you take human corneal epithelial cells and incubate them in isotonic and hyperosmolar media with or without osmoprotectants, one can see that the elevated osmolarity, which relates, which produces an increased activation of some of these enzymes. And you can see here in the, in the hypertonic media, the enzyme activation doubles, and then it comes down very rapidly when you put the same hypertonic media, but along with the osmoprotectants. Another of these enzymes, similarly, the uh, hypertonicity caused a trebling of the phosphorylation activity, but then that got halved once we put them into hypertonic, uh, once we expose them to carnitine and erythritol. So the addition of osmoprotectants in these hyperosmolar media significantly decreases the ratios of phosphorylation to the total MAP kinases. Similarly, if you take desiccated uh, porcine uh, corneal cells, and uh, we look at these and we see uh, this is the ratio of the epithelium to the stroma. It's about nine to 10%. In the, in the porcine eye, uh, in a normal eye, that's where it looks like the, when you start to dehydrate, the percentage of the epithelium shrinks and you can see the dehydration has produced a shrinkage here. Once we uh, rehydrate this using uh, a normal, uh, uh, a non-protective uh, lubricant, there is an element of rehydration that happens, but the moment you put it with something which is osmotically regulated, you find that the rehydration levels are superior. So osmoprotectants suppress the production and activity of MMPs induced by hyperosmolarity in human corneal epithelial cells as well. So it's not that it's, uh, it's limited to the porcine cornea. It is also there in the human cells as well. So you can see here the expression of MMP7, MMP3 and MMP13 at normal osmolarity at 400 milliosmoles, you can see how much it has increased. And then at 450 milliosmoles, it increases quite substantially. But when you put the same and you expose it to L-carnitine and erythritol, you can see that the expression of these enzymes is almost like it was a, a normosmolar or an isosmolar material. And so there's a suppressive effect of L-carnitine and erythritol on the MMP protein production in human corneal cells as well. Uh, clinically also there is evidence and when you compare uh, data coming in from osmotically regulated tear preparations versus uh, the conventional preparations, 
you find that the OSDI scores, the mean number of drops required are better. If you look at very large series of data of uh, keratoconjunctivitis sicca, you can find that there was a substantial improved comfort and improved clinical signs from baseline, as well as an improvement in the trail breakup time. L-carnitine has also uh, come out to be uh, very protective for the ocular surface. And uh, recently they found that there was a substantial reduction in the L-carnitine levels in tears, uh, almost a 70% reduction in the amount of L-carnitine in tears. And so uh, it stands to reason that supplementation with L-carnitine is likely to make uh, these patients uh, slightly better and be able to handle the osmolar stress in a much better way. So L-carnitine, erythritol, glycerol, and trihalose, which is a small carbohydrate sugar, are the current osmoprotectants that are available to us in our armamentarium. There are many others that are there but we are going to restrict our discussion to these four. It's also important to look at the kinetic properties of these kinetic of these compatible solutes. So these compatible solutes can go in and out of the cell with different speeds. So there are those which are small molecules like glycerol, which can go in rapidly and come out rapidly. Erythritol, a little larger molecule, which can rapidly go in with passive diffusion, but it takes longer time for it to come out. And those that are actively carried, such as L-carnitine, which need an active transport mechanism, and a combination of osmoprotectants in a, uh, in a formulation is likely to give you a better control over the uh, capacity to handle hyperosmolar stress rather than a random addition of only one or two of these uh, items in the formulation. So the conventional artificial tears have a limited impact on the ocular surface damage but they, since they only decrease evaporation and increase retention time, they neutralize the hypertonic state only marginally, but they act only at the surface. So it's important that these uh, uh, osmoprotectant uh, containing uh, uh, compounds should be included in all our uh, dry eye preparations. So there's significant ocular surface damage in the presence of a normal tear film, which is mediated by hyperosmolarity which is a key mechanism uh, as already explained in inflammation, apoptosis and tear film instability. And the use of inorganic solutes and compatible solutes uh, maintain the osmotic balance. Uh, hypotonic solutions, as I said earlier, provide only very transient relief. So compatible solutes help regulate the osmolar balance and, uh, and restore the tear film osmolarity. And there's a lot of clinical evidence that osmoprotectants are very useful and incorporating compatible solutes with different kinetic properties in these tear substitutes may be more effective in protecting patients from dry eye disease. So that pretty much sums up my discussion on uh, hyperosmolarity and be very happy to take questions. Uh, but I'm going to go on and do the next bit, which is uh, about uh, the uh, uh, inflammation. And uh, this uh, slide was already shown. And you can see here, this is where uh, inflammation takes a role with all the uh, uh, secretions of all these stress factors and, and uh, interleukins and cytokines. And uh, we know that dry eye is a chronic immune-mediated inflammatory disease and is dependent on T cell activation in the chronic form. And this affects the entire ocular surface and there is ocular surface damage and reduced tear secretion. This is triggered by the uh, uh, this is triggered by numerous actions, which may be intrinsic or extrinsic. There are environmental challenges, there are infections, there's other stress, endogenic and otherwise. There's the immune system, the genetic factors, and it's the interrelationship and interaction with all these that produces the, uh, the inflammation on the surface. The increase in tear film osmolarity produces the hyperosmotic and desiccating mechanical shear and stress and leads to these innate inflammatory events. Again, coming to that slide that I showed earlier, showing the timelines on this, you can see that after the eighth day, it enters phase three. And phase three means it is now cell-mediated inflammation. It is not inflammation which is purely related to the chemicals that were released because of the acute epithelial stress. But now there is a second wave of inflammatory stress being produced by the influx of uh, the activated T cells being derived from the tissues. So various techniques have been developed to diagnose dry eye uh, inflammation. 
and uh, to identify and validate this ocular surface inflammatory biomarkers, some of which we use clinically to further understand the inflammatory mechanisms and to assess the clinical efficacy of the anti-inflammatory treatments. So we can see here that the hyperosmolar tears, the, the gender androgen deficiency and other systemic uh, issues like Sjogren's and rheumatoid arthritis produce a secretory dysfunction which leads to conjunctivitis sicca and ocular surface inflammation, which then leads to T cell infiltration. And that leads to the release of all these that eventually lands up with uh, cell damage and cell death. So when we talk about therapy in dry eye and we look at inflammation as one of those areas, we can start with what we call the topical corticosteroids. Now, if you look at the DUES-1, uh, which was in 2007, they never spoke of steroids as a, a mechanism to treat, even though we were treating it. But DUES-2 has now incorporated it as part of its treatment protocol. And non-glucocorticoid immunomodulators, there's enough on that. There's cyclosporin, tacrolimus, there the other NSAIDs, and the newer biologics um, that are there. The neuropeptides, the uh, uh, lifetigras, which is the lymphocyte function associated antigen antagonist, and other inflammatory modulations with uh, antibiotics, the tetracycline group, especially doxycycline. Steroids are by far the most commonly prescribed short-term treatment for managing uh, dry eye associated inflammation. Uh, multiple studies have shown their value. They act on the entire cascade of inflammation and therefore right from the time of the inhibition of the phospholipase, which is the beginning of the cascade till the very end, it has an impact at every point of the cascade and that's why it is so effective. And it is shown to clinically improve uh, dry eye symptoms. However, there are issues with steroid use. As we all know, there, the long-term use is not recommended. And the newer steroids like fluoromethylone and lotiprednol may have more value than the conventional strongest steroids. Talking of cyclosporin, it's a, an immunomodulatory drug with anti-inflammatory properties. It reduces many markers of inflammation. It has anti-apoptotic effects, which are uh, relevant to the known reversal of the uh, epithelial cell leukocyte relationship. It is reported to result in the recovery of reduced goblet cell density. But it takes time for the impacts to come up, and that's very important to remember. So when, uh, if we start to look at some of this data, you can see the baseline data here and the six months post data here of the number of activated T cells in the conjunctive of patient with dry eye. And we find that there is a substantial reduction in the number of activated T cells after treatment with cyclosporin. Similarly, there is a substantial reduction with time on the... Uh, effect of uh, the, uh, the lymphocyte activation marker CD11A and the HLA-DR antigen, which reduce substantially in the presence of cyclosporin as compared to the vehicle. Other multicenter randomized studies on the efficacy and safety have again revealed a lot of ad uh, advantages uh, in uh, cyclosporin treated individuals. The US phase three study uh, showed a significant reduction in quality and staining scores a change from baseline in Sherma values measured with anesthesia, a significant improvement in the vision blur compared to controls, a significant reduction in the amount of doses of artificial tears being used compared to baseline, and almost a 200% increase in goblet cell density over a period of time. So the summary of uh, uh, the mode of action of uh, cyclosporin is that it reduces the number of activated T cells, the multiple inflammatory cytokines get reduced, there's a decreased ocular surface staining, it reduces apoptosis, it increases the density of the goblet cells, and it increases uh, tear production directly and indirectly. So who are the candidates and when is it indicated? So if one looks at the profile, one has to pick up the candidates in which uh, the patients whose tear production is presumed to be suppressed due to ocular inflammation. And so the potential candidates would naturally be uh, not those with very occasional symptoms uh, who may use an occasional eye drop once in a while and not with the severest symptoms either where there are no functional lacrimal glands available for a substantial amount of impact to be there. But those who are in the middle, the chronic tear users with the unresolved symptoms, with the potential contact lens intolerant patients, the postmenopausal women. So these are your potential uh, CSA candidates, which as luck would have it, uh, happen to be the majority of them. It's also important to remember the, the real world experiences with cyclosporin. So here's almost 6,000 patients who completed surveys 
and one can see that 32% of these started to notice some onset of relief by the end of the first week. But it was 73% by the time it was three weeks. So it's important to remember that you cannot expect dramatic gains like with, you can get with steroids to get them with cyclosporin. It takes time. Symptom severity and symptom impact on everyday activities decreased by about 30% after about a month. So it's important to keep that in mind always when we are prescribing to these patients. Tacrolimus is very similar to cyclosporin. It blocks T lymphocyte activity. Its immunosuppressive potential is higher, but it has uh, more side effects. The changes in Sherman and TBUT values in the initial treatment uh, can be seen uh, very rapidly, but then again, it also takes a few weeks for the best impact to come and is a viable alternative where there is intolerance for some reason to topical cyclosporin. Omega-3 I brought in because uh, it was uh, something that we were using uh, quite a bit. And after the DREAM study, it's gone into a little bit of a debate. I still, of course, uh, personally prefer to use it in patients who I feel are lipid deficient. Uh, there, definitely, I feel that there is a role for Omega-3. So it has a, a, a wide uh, uh, aspect of anti-inflammatory activity and does lead to an increase in TS secretion. It's a multifaceted role. It, uh, it pretty much uh, affects every aspect of the tear film. And I think it's, it's quite an effective adjunct to be used uh, in our dry eye patients. Lifetagras is a, a newer uh, player on the block. Uh, it's still not available in India. I'm not sure when it will be introduced. But it's an a, it's a integral lymphocyte function associated antigen antagonist. And it forms an immunological synapse, which results in T cell activation and migration to the target tissue. It binds and blocks the interaction of LFA1. And this uh, is uh, re uh, reduces the amount of uh, T cell activation that happens. Um, so it uh, is a competitive antagonist. And the solution that is used uh, clinically is a 5% solution. This is being studied as a treatment for dry eye disease. One last thing that I think is important is the CD44 surface uh, uh, marker. And this is an adhesion molecule, and it adheres to sodium hyaluronate. And uh, when the cell damage takes place, the CD44 expression on the surface goes up. And uh, when we're talking uh, of uh, using sodium hyaluronate in these advanced or moderately advanced dry eyes, uh, it is uh, thought that the sodium hyaluronate, unlike uh, conventional artificial tears may actually help regeneration of epithelial cells because of the impact that it has on the CD44 uh, surface adhesion molecule. So to protect against the mechanisms of dry eye disease, the goal is to improve the patient's quality of life, symptoms, and visual function by re-establishing homeostasis. One should aim to prevent the patient from entering the vicious circle or promote his exit. And preventing entry into the circle refers to addressing the causative factors such as systemic disease and contact lens use and certain environmental factors, surgeries, lasers, infections. Promoting exit would involve addressing the central mechanisms such as the inflammation of the lacrimal unit as well as the tear hyperosmolarity. Uh, so this are the, is just the entire uh, uh, overall view of the therapies which we can use to target the pathophysiological mechanisms of dry eye and osmo protection and tear substitutes with regards to hyperosmolarity, uh, oral tetracyclines, antibiotics, steroids, cyclosporin, and O3FAs for inflammation uh, are the two areas where we would like to concentrate, at least as far as this talk is concerned. So thank you very much. I hope that was uh, uh, useful for, for most of us. And uh, I hope you're all staying at home and staying safe and uh, being positive and staying negative. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Rishi. That was a very comprehensive uh, coverage of all the complex molecular cascades which are involved in uh, dry eye disease. I think one question which everybody wants to know about is uh, what are the clinical implications of hyperosmolarity in day-to-day -day practice? Um, well, uh, we, uh, we know that whenever there is a dry eye, there is a hyperosmolarity. So that is, uh, even though we are not able to actively measure it because we don't have the tools, not we don't have the tools, it's just that the tools are not available to us for various reasons, either they're too expensive or the availability is not there. 
also the reliability and the variability on a temporal uh, sequence where if you remeasure these patients uh, from time to time you will get differing results has uh, made osmolarity as not a favored tool uh, by clinicians so but hyperosmolarity exists and uh, one has to start to look at the environmental factors which are producing the hyperosmolarity one of them being evaporation evaporation can be reduced by either humidifying the atmosphere we can improve uh, humidification by uh, reducing the amount of fans and speeds which are there reducing air conditioning which are work like desiccants uh, treating the evaporative dry eye which means the meibomian side of things is very important because that will help uh, reduce the hyperosmolar load Thank you, Dr. Rishi. Anything which Dr. Ritu or Dr. Tritial would like to add? I think let's go on to the next talk. Okay. Okay. So I think we'll take uh, further questions at the end if we have time. And I would now invite uh, Dr. Piyush to give his talk, which is something I think the most awaited, how to choose the right lubricant. Over to you, Dr. Piyush. I think Dr. Piyush. I think you are yeah, you are muted, Piyush. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Unmute Am I audible now? Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. Start from now, huh? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you, doc, uh, Dr. Vanathi, for the opportunity. Uh, in just, I would say, after hearing my uh, two speakers talk about dry eye, I truly feel that dry eye is more of a Pandora's box. It's like you know something. As Dr. Rishi was again and again saying, a vicious circle. I say that it's a chakravyu. that once the patient enters into it he is just rolling around in it and that's why the incidence which dr vishal pointed out in his uh, epidemiology that it almost constitute to 30 to 40% of the patients in our uh, clinic it's, it's, so the screen is not moving uh, i am having okay so going on to the epidemiology which has already been talked i would just say that uh, the it is more important to understand the real cause of dry eye which is about 35 to uh, 36% of the patients have an evaporative component 20.6% have an aqueous deficient one and a major chunk of the patients about 40% are the ones with the mixed entity it is uh, undoubtedly clear that all these patients have a poor quality of life and they are really troubled with this symptoms of dry eye and that's why they are again and again rolling out in our opds as clinicians we have lot many treatment options available but i would say it is important to understand the main cause of the disease where we are actually heading towards and then plan the treatment options for these patients broadly for a general ophthalmologist i would say that if you look at a patient of dry eye what you have in hand is first of all a tear substitute then is the tear conservation the stimulation for tears and the lipid stimulation as it was told by dr vishal in the ipl there are lot many options still available as immunomodulators autologous serums ipl amniotic membrane therapy but without going into the details of it i would talk the real thing which the first clinician has to write it to the patient or prescribe it that is the aqueous supplement as a clinician i would like to see that what do i expect out of an aqueous supplement is that it has a visco enhancing agent which covers the symptoms of the patient it has a good osmotic agent which uh, as talked about my previous speaker decreases the osmolarity and decreases the worse which is gives uh, the inflammation and gives a good osmo protectant antioxidants can be a part of it and the real evil of the drug is the preservative which cannot be actually parted with looking into the options available in india we have more than half a dozen of drugs available and out of these we need to choose that what is right for our patient so looking at the aqueous supplements the most important is that what does an aqueous supplement do it in fact is enhancing the visco uh, the viscosity of the tears increasing the tear film thickness 
protecting them against the desiccation produced by the inflammation on the ocular surface a retention of the tear film increasing the goblet cells density and maintains a good physiological corneal thickness so with these half a dozen uh, options available with us i would say we need to protect our tear film in the right way to give a right ocular surface to our eyes now talking about the first option and the most common option being cmc which is the carboxymethyl cellulose it very well binds to the epithelial cells promotes the epithelial healing and is an ideal choice for the mild to moderate cases being a muco adhesive it has got a good retention time on the ocular surface and an higher concentration of these drugs which is commonly used in the more severe cases is a definite cause of blurring and may be unacceptable to a few patients so the most commonly being prescribed is a 0.5 concentration with cmc the next in the line is hpmc or the hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose again having a good retention it is a less viscous substance than the cmc but has a superior cohesive and an emollient property again a good choice in the mild to moderate cases of the dry eyes and available in various strengths but the main disadvantage is about the crusting present on the lips which may be cosmetically unacceptable to the patient the next in line is the hp guar or the commonly uh, available as uh, cystein ultra which is more, one of the most popular brands for this molecule which confers a high viscosity through a ph dependent process which would be very well depicted in this uh, slide which shows that in the when while it is in the bottle it is broken up into small fragments of hp guar borate the sorbitrate the pg and the peg which is the polyethylene glycol but once it enters into the uh, the lacrimal uh, uh, area the ph dependent process actually causes a cross linkage in this uh, uh, ocular surface which gives a gel like matrix which rightly spreads all over the surface of the ocular uh, of the eye and gives a very good retention of the tear film and prolongs the demulcent effect on the ocular surface it increases the mucus layer thickness reduces the inflammation and very well protects the surface a combination of hp guar with hyaluronic acid is commonly available in uh, not in india but outside india and has a very good desiccation protection and has an added advantage of hyaluronic acid as it was rightly pointed out uh, by uh, uh, of cd44 which was explained by dr rishi and a combination of hp guar which gives a uniform tear film a gel like tear film on the ocular surface the vinyl derivatives the i would say the ones with the less retention time are commonly used for a mild or moderate cases which is the pva the polyvinyl alcohol and the providin combination which gives us a water soluble uh, substance which is a mucomimetic in nature gives a good osmotic uh, uh, pressure over the surface and a good surface sting it has got a nice tear film stable effect but which lasts not too long but just about half an hour the next in the line is the hyaluronic acid which has just come into more popularity in the recent past because of its control on the inflammation uh, uh, with the cd44 pathway the substance has a very good ocular surface uh, binding potential and has a wound healing property this increases the viscosity and provides enhanced lubrication it exhibits a very good shearing thinning properties which decreases the blurring effect in spite of having a great viscosity the hydroxypropyl methyl uh, cellulose which is available as lecrecert though not available in india is meant for the patients of severe dry eye and it is commonly put in the inferior caldi sac lasts for about 12 hours but has a common issue of blurring of vision and irritation which makes it a little unacceptable to a few patients osmo protectants has been very well covered by dr rishi the basic gist in the talk i would say the whole idea is to protect inflammation on the ocular surface along with giving a good uh, uh, a good surface tint property by a lubricant and this inflammation if controlled the dry eye process is definitely curtailed 
antioxidants which may form a part of the ts substitutes again have a similar property but unfortunately not many antioxidant combinations with dry eye, uh, with the ts substitutes are available in india the one which is available uh, commonly in the market is the viscomitin which is available also in russia and has in fact shown a very good uh, healing property along with the ts substitutes on the ocular surface the worst in the uh, in my ts substitutes comes the preservative but it's an essential one so this is present in the ts substitute to prevent the microbial growth and is unexpected, unexpected accordingly causing some irregular uh, irregular conditions on the ocular surface and is thus causing a vicious circle of causing inflammation on the eye the preservative induced inflammation or the allergic reaction causes an oxidative stress or apoptosis it causes more worsening of the dry eye and more worsening causes increased use of the preservative fluid which is the artificial tear and thus increasing the vicious circle of the allergic and the cytotoxic mechanism worsening the dry eye condition so how can we really avoid it is by choosing the right preservative and or the right tear substitute which has got a preservative which is friendly to the ocular surface the back which was the most commonly used preservative is the most undesirable one as it falls in the category of uh, the uh, of the uh, 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 of the tear substitutes which is a deter detergent type it causes damages to uh, damage to the ocular nerves causes loss of goblet cells affects the wound healing and disrupts the cytoplasmic membrane causing a much affected ocular surface the frequency of the usage of these tear substitutes with back is the main cause of causing the ocular toxicity so if it is a uh, patient which needs a high frequency of installation it is better to avoid a drug which contains this pack polyquad or the one which is present in cystine ultra there is again a quaternary ammonium compound which is a, a derivative of back and falls in the same category of the deter detergent type of preservative it was a common preservative which was being used in the contact lens causes a superficial epithelial damage and is cytotoxic even in vitro or in seen in the animal models amongst the oxidative types of uh, preservatives the newer generation preservatives the first to be talked about is the stabilized oxychloro complex which is a broad antimicrobial uh, agent even at low concentration it has got an improved tolerability on the ocular surface it has got reduced toxicity and the reduced toxicity is because it breaks up into sodium chloride ions water and oxygen which do not have any toxic effect on the ocular surface upon exposure to light the next amongst this uh, uh, group of uh, preservatives that is the oxidative preservatives is the pyruvate Uh, sorry is the sodium perborate the sodium perborate is an other ocular friendly uh, preservative which breaks down into water and oxygen on the contact with the tear film and that uh, exactly what happens is that the sodium perborate first breaks down into hydrogen peroxide which is in such a low concentration that about 0.03% which is highly highly uh, friendly to the ocular surface this h2o2 then breaks up into Uh, this h2o2 then breaks up into water and oxygen in com uh, in contact with the catalase which is present in the tear film and thus causing no damage to the ocular surface but all set and done all preservatives whether it is soc or whether it is the sodium perborate are toxic to the surface to some extent or the other and there is nothing which can actually compete with a preservative free combination which i would say will be very clear with this slide which says that with the use of preservative free cmc and when it was compared with the cmc with soc the patients who were uh, on preservative free drug were 100% uh, better as compared to the those which were with the combination of soc the reason for them is that when on high 
frequency of installation, even whether it is a uh, SOC or it is a sodium perborate, they are toxic to the ocular surface to some extent or the other, and they are of course cannot be matched to the preservative free molecules. And of course, in an other experiment where it showed that the signs in these patients also improved in terms of decreased congestion, decreased mucus debris, loss of uh, corneal luster was also less and the mebomitis was also less in the patients who were put on the preservative free CMC as compared to those who were put on the CMC with SOC. Affordability comes an other issue, especially in our Indian population, where I would say the clinician always has to put an attention to. Like we can treat a patient with a very affordable product like a CMC, which may be as good as about a 10 to 15 rupees as compared to a molecule like sodium hyaluronide, which may cost about a 400 rupees. So it is the clinician's choice to choose the right drug, but at the same time also see the patient's pocket and decide which drug to choose for his or her patient. Coming down to the options, when we talk about a single drug like CMC, when we talk about has got n number of options with different companies coming up with different uh, trade names. The first thing as a clinician I would look into is that what preservative does it contain? What composition does it have? And then for the cost to check for the affordability of the patient. Like if in composition I see that my patient would only require a single drug like CMC and may not you have uh, require any additive a single drug with an economical cost would be the choice. But of course, looking at the preservative index of the drugs available, I would say the one which is more friendly to the eye, like the uh, stabilized oxychlorocomplex or the sodium perborate would be the choice to be prescribed to the patient. Going down to the additives, like when we are dealing with the situation where eye is actually inflamed and it has got uh, the need of uh, osmo protection, then the need of various molecules like what was talked about, glycerin, the uh, L-carnitine or the uh, vitamin A is required in these patients. And the choice would shift from a single CMC based molecule to the one with these additives. Now, along with the additives, the next comes the preservative, which again has to be looked into very carefully. The preservative load should not increase and third being the cost would decide which drug to be given to these patients amongst the list of brands present with me. Going down to the choice of CMC 1%, I would say that the patients who have got a comparatively a severe form of dry eye would require the drug which is more viscous and has got a more retention time instead of the less retention one which is the 0.5% one. The next being the molecule HPMC which I would say would be the choice in a mild to moderate case with a less retention time. And of course, when looking into the whole plethora of composition, I would say that it should be preservative friendly. I generally would avoid any drug which contains back and actually want to give my patient the drug which contains a more friendly preservative like the sodium perborate or the stabilized oxychlorocomplex instead of the older generation back once. Talking about sodium hyaluronate, which is one of the most preferred drug in the severe dry eye conditions, I would say that looking into the composition of sodium hyaluronate, going down to the preservative one, I would actually like to choose a drug which is actually preservative free, like the Lubri, which is stabilized in the packing, which comes with a uniflow kind of a thing, which does not allow the air to uh, uh, come back into the bottle thus causing a preservative free environment in the molecule and preventing any infection to travel in the bottle. So if the preservative load is absolutely zero, the drug would be always the preferred one. And yes, cost is a factor into it, but I have put cost or the affordability as the last after choosing the composition and the preservative in the drug. Then the PEG, which was uh, the polyethylene glycol or the HP GUAR uh, molecule, like the Cysteine Ultra, the Lubril Ultra, or the Normo TS available in the market. I would say that uh, the after looking at the composition, if the composition is one and the same in most of the uh, most of the drugs, 
the most preferred amongst the polyquad or the sodium perborate would be the sodium perborate which is comparatively more friendly to the ocular surface as compared to the oxychloro complex pva remains the choice in the patients with a very mild disease who just need some tr substitutes in a lesser frequency but chlorobutol which is a less desirable preservative and i would say the uh, my uh, uh, preference would be to always avoid a drug with chlorobutol which may not be as uh, ocular surface friendly as compared to the other uh, ones available like the stabilized oxychloro complex but still if it is used in a lesser frequency 3 to 3 to 4 times of installation in a day would still be okay for a patient panthenol is a, a drug which prevents the uh, which prevents ocular surface from the inflammation as is an odd add on to sodium hyaluronate in protecting the ocular surface and most of the disease eyes and actually helps in the epithelial regeneration vitamin a has been talked about and the secretogogs is an other important factor which is being used in the severe dry eye conditions and i think that secretogogs though it is causing a little stinging sensation but when choosing a drug the next what i need to see is the preservative in the secretogog which makes it more friendly to the ocular surface and then looking at the cost of the drug cyclosporin has been in length covered by dr rishi mohan who actually uh, gave the mechanism that cyclosporin how useful it is for the ocular surface in the inflamed eye but when prescribing again a drug choosing in cyclosporin i would say look at again the composition look at the preservative in them and preferably choose a preservative free unims rather than going in a multivoil drug though the cost may be high in the so coming down to the recommendations while choosing a drug and prescribing to the patient that which is the best for my patient is undoubtedly preservative free drug is the best but when you have to choose the preservative like in a condition like india where the preservative free options are not commonly available i would say sodium perborate or the chlorite is the most acceptable one back or the polyquid a bit undesirable back generally i would say should be avoided and choosing a drug for conditions like evaporative dry eye a more viscous substance like sodium hyaluronate hpmc or the peg analogs must be used choosing a drug for the aqueous deficiency one for a milder one i would say a cmc 0.5% sodium hyaluronate still remains the choice in these cyclosporin or tacrolimus like anti inflammatory agents are important where we need to curtail the inflammation in these patient uh, patients and additional components like the osmoprotectants have been already discussed in detail and wherever we see any kind of an ocular inflammation yes of course these components have to be chosen judiciously thank you and before concluding i would say that it is uh, i would request the moderator to choose six conditions and uh, of uh, clinical uh, cases like when uh, mild to moderate yes. mild to moderate cases of cds where we need to decide that which drug and i would like my experts on the panel to actually discuss about that which would be their choice and coming down to the conclusion for that thank you piyush and uh... i think we uh, before we just go on to that there are about uh, five or six questions which have been uh, which are come from the uh, from the audience so if the chair allows can i put in the questions and uh, the speakers and the panel can take it up one by one as well Will i think varat you can start uh, if the yeah. questions are relevant you can start with the yes question. sir so uh, uh, there is uh, gunava prasad who is, is asking us uh, when will you start uh, steroids in dry eye disease uh, one thing uh, piyush can you stop sharing your screen because then everybody all the panelists will come uh, in the screen okay, stop okay, sharing your screen uh, right yeah. sir i just i just do the need okay. i think navarta can answer this question yes sir. what was the question sir sorry i didn't when, when will uh, when will you consider to start steroids in dry eye disease So topical steroids would be started whenever there is any evidence of inflammation, which would most likely be in your uh, severe uh, form of dry eye. 
So I would like to start the disease when it is severe and when there is marked inflammation, which is present, which is not getting controlled. This could be in conditions like, you know, you have vernal keratoconjunctivitis cases with dry eye, or sometimes even you have uh, SJS with dry eye with inflammation when there are acute exacerbations. So in those cases, uh, I think I would like to start steroids. Okay. And I would start it with topical cyclosporin so that uh, uh, the the vicious cycle which is there is broken by the topical steroids and then the topical cyclosporin takes over which can be given for a prolonged period of time. Okay. Uh, thank you, ma'am. But there's another follow-up question on that. One minute, uh, and I yeah. just want to add that whenever we have the immune-mediated dry eye, especially associated with the immunological disorders, so those cases do very well when we add topical steroids. Yes. And there, right. if you really look at the inferior palpable conjunctiva, you know, there is quite a bit of congestion. So those cases do extremely well and cases of dry eye with OCP. So, that so whenever there is a presence of significant ocular surface inflammation, it warrants right. the use of a concurrent steroid drops along with your topical lubricants. Uh, another follow up question on this was, from, what would you, uh, would you combine steroids with cyclosporinate? Dr. Ritu. Dr. Dr. Namrata already answered right. the question. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Already answered. Uh, so, Dr. Vanati, yes. can I ask a question to Dr. Rishi? Uh, yes. Sir. I what what I would add in this uh, Vanati is that when we are talking of combining a steroid with cyclosporin, uh, they are not exclusive to each other. Yes. They are actually doing the same job. Uh, what's important to remember is that cyclosporin, the impact will come in four weeks. The steroid, the impact will come fairly immediately. So the idea is to initiate with the steroid and allow the cyclosporin impact to come in and then tail the steroid off. And of course, the choice of steroid and the dosing of steroid will be based on the level of inflammation, like Namrata said. I would even look at maybe the moderate dry eyes, which will need anti-inflammatory control to initiate the process. I may give them a couple of weeks or three weeks of a BD or a TDS steroid, uh, like a fluoromethylone or something. So the understanding is that you would control the uh, acute inflammatory process with steroids and then put on your cyclosporins and uh, tail off the steroids slowly and put your uh, cyclosporins on for a longer period of time. Correct. And that can yeah. be a seamless pro process. Yes. It doesn't yes. have to be yeah. uh, Absolutely. Off. Also, de depends on the kind of disease profile you are treating, uh, uh, treating as well. Dr. Piyush, you wanted to ask something. Uh, yeah. I, I just wanted like to brief uh, about... Uh, that if we are, uh, I would like to ask the panelists that uh, if we are choosing a drug, I would like the opinion of uh, Dr. Tatyal and Dr. Ritu, that what would be the drug of choice when we are treating a case of PRK or a post classic? Dr. Tatyal, <coughs> Dr. Ritu, what would be uh, the drug of choice when you're treating refractive surgery patients, right? Especially the PRK ones, like do you... Uh, give a normal lubricant or you prefer giving some analogs along with the normal lubricants to enhance epithelial healing or give a smoother ocular bed on these patients? I think, you know, all these patient uh, post-refractive patients, they are, they are, you know, normally uh, these are cases would require a lubricant for a not very long time, but a reasonably long time because the dryness doesn't go off immediately. And the ocular surface is always at compromised compromise condition after PRK, especially and LASIK. So these are cases you already have compromised ocular surface. So I would like to, as you rightly said, maybe a, a preservative-free medication would be better. It's something which can give you a better epithelial protection. Because epithelial protection is a major challenge for these patients. And I would normally go with the nowadays with the sodium hyaluronate uh, type of drops in these cases which will be there for uh, at least for a few months, maybe a six months, the PRK maybe for one year, in, in fact. You know. So uh, if I have an acute patient, there are two categories of dry eye, if you see generally, but in the acute onset dry eye, like the post-surgical, you rightly said, refractive, cataract surgery, there the requirement may not be for a very long period. It's better to give a, you know, better drugs you know, for a shorter duration. And there's a chronic dry eye patient which we discussed, you know, where they, you require, you know, immunomodulators, steroids, different types of lubricants, and uh, maybe uh, give a little more uh, longer duration drugs. Then you have to titrate these conditions. The acute cases, I'll give a preservative-free, 
for you know uh, for our duration which is required yes the sodium hyaluronate i feel at times it does give blurring of vision now if you go so, with a slightly higher concentration now the yeah. people are coming with a lot of combinations yes and these combination yes. drugs are creating a problem for us yes so if you, you rightly said if you go the pure sodium hyaluronate like you had you know a few initial uh, medications they are very good but these combination drugs are ca creating problems and also once one word of caution and dr banati also once talked about it that they have the ha written and uh, when sodium hyaluronate yes. yes. so i had patients walking in with whom i drops and complete yeah, they were given uh, home atrophy uh, so, so be very very careful you know so, so there's another question which uh, is asking about yes, the dr. role dr. of dr balla had a question no? dr balla okay. had a question uh, we are having a series of questions which have typed in Uh, yeah, doctor. Okay. Yes, I was. Uh, I was just wanting to, uh, you know, add to what uh, Doctor Tyal and what Ritu said. Is that all these patients who've had refractive surgery are also going to be on a steroid? That's exactly. Now, uh, yeah, that was the my point. The steroid yeah. is in the picture. Then the requirement of the uh, lubricant sort of changes a little bit. Maybe a little less. I have to go for sodium hyaluronate. And if I look at the first fifteen years of my refractive experience. Sodium hyaluronate didn't exist, so what did we use? We were using uh, CMC pretty much, and they did fairly well. Uh, the thing with these uh, conditions, it's a short-term inflammation and a short-term dry eye. So there, you can be more flexible in your approach as compared to those where you expect there to be a degree of constancy, which Dr. Tetyal has said. But but Rishi, it's not a short-term dry eye. It lasts for as long as six, six months. months. Six yeah. months. Yes, six months. Yes, but then you are going to well. Uh, I think. i still think if they are responding clinically well you can start with cmc and then if not or there were patients who had a pre existing predisposition then you can convert them to a slightly i think i i would agree a cmc for lasik patients but not for prk because prk the yes. whole epithelium has to epithelium is being removed yeah. and so i think sodium hyaluronic which i said is a better option but of course everybody Okay. On the note, when we are discussing different molecules, so uh, what is the role of chloroquine in uh, management of dry eye? Sir can answer that best, best because <laughs> <we cannot. laughs> yes, Doctor Sir. We have the professor. I think I think uh, uh, people have not covered uh, chloroquine into a yes. treatment modality. It is a. Yeah. Uh, I think many people uh, have tried this, and some patients have wonderfully, you know, accepted uh, this medication. as a you know substitute for a cyclosporin uh, in in a group of dry eye conditions the first experience uh, we had that we published also in current eye research where we use chloroquine now mild to moderate dry eye cases to begin with and uh, we continued uh, them for one month to three month course and they did uh, very well so that gave us gives us a you know opportunity to look into a uh, chloroquine for a uh, in a uh, longer duration uh, application and other indication like we just discussed the post refractive surgery uh, cases and uh, number five already on uh, doing a research on this also would uh, and we just finished the thesis where we compared chloroquine versus cyclosporine in a post lasik patients the results will come out very soon now and uh, we'll publish that also we uh, treated all these patients with chloroquine and uh, uh, this uh, steroid along with the lubricants for these patients for a uh, 3 months And we found that uh, normal refractive patients, the ocular surface are much better if you use uh, chloroquine and cyclosporine as a treatment modality in these cases in six months, three to six months, compared to a uh, non, uh, you know, immunomodulators. So they do have a value, and I appreciate chloroquine uh, would be a good choice for a uh, you know selective uh, group of patients, especially if you have a patient already had a systemic immuno uh, uh, autoimmune disorders. Uh, this may be a uh, uh, wonderful addition and if you have covid it is good to work well yes that's what i guess yes yes dr ritu here uh, uh, what is the role of uh, autologous serum drops in the management of dry eye disease and then immune mediated dry eye you know they are very very helpful and i don't of course use them as a first line management and especially if i have a immune mediated dry eye and sometimes when they have associated a lot of epi defects the autologous serum really comes very very handy and some cases where i do not want to give topical steroids so there also i like to put these patients on uh, autologous serum the only question is how you prepare it and maintain the sterility of the drops that's a little bit of an issue but um, i prefer them more over steroids 
Thank you, ma'am. And to Dr. Rishi again, um, how long would you like to give uh, omega-3 fatty acids? This is one of the questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rishi. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if there is a, a, an easy answer to that. It's uh, similar to how long would you give cyclosporin or how long would you give yes. uh, any of these anti-inflammatories for that matter? But are, we giving, are, are we for that matter giving now omega-3 fatty acids? I don't know how many of us. I, I am still in it. my evaporative disease where I suspect the MGD to have a significant role. I am still using omega-3. Uh, for my pure aqueous deficiencies, I have moved away from it. But if I think there is a significant evaporative component, I think I, I still feel more comfortable giving them some O3 a day. Uh, how long to give it? I think it's a, it's a tough call because uh, I don't think there are enough studies which would uh, tell us as to when to stop. Um, the dose we give is just a supplemental dose in the end. I mean, the daily requirement of O3 FA is about 1200 milligrams. And we are giving about 300 milligrams or at best 500 milligrams a day which is uh, uh, not really, uh, uh, it's not really a substitution for the requirement that is there. So it's just a supplement. And as a supplement, I don't know if you can make a guideline as to when to stop. So I think it has to be clinically uh, based, uh, the experience. Uh, some of these patients who are on these supplements tend to complain of GI disturbance. That may be a reason to stop it. Uh, there may be those who may feel that there is, they're having excessive uh, oily secretion or something, that may be a reason to stop it. Otherwise, uh, I don't see a problem with giving uh, 300 milligrams of uh, omega-3 FA, O3 FA for a length of time. Thank you, sir. And uh, I think uh, we are almost coming to the closure time. There's one more question here, which uh, is yeah. asking uh, about the role of microwavable eye masks in uh, uh, hot compression treatments versus the conventional treatment in women gland dysfunctions. Well, I, I have seen uh, patients, you know, uh, have a useful, you know, uh, of these, you know, heatable, uh, you know, those uh, devices, and they are quite useful, especially after the patient has undergone uh, the P-flow type of treatment. So, as a as a, a substitute at home, they can use this, and they found uh, this to be a very effective way to handle rather than using a conventional heating of, you know, clothes or something like that. These devices are very, very helpful. Yes, I, I, I totally agree with Dr. Tial. The, the ease of use uh, is so good. You just take it, you put it into the microwave for 10 or 15 seconds and just hold it. Uh, the big advantage is that there is a sustained release at a regulated temperature that these devices give. And uh, for four minutes, otherwise uh, for four minutes, you have to use a, a, a device uh, such as a cotton pad or you know, a handkerchief or any of those things, or, and I don't prefer to use these gel based packs because they can actually burn you and they can actually produce more trauma than benefit. But Dr. So Dishi, are you, are you using them as an adjuvant to the normal IPL therapy or it is as a substitute for them you recommend? No, it's both ways. There, there are, there are people uh, who found this when uh, we didn't have uh, lippy flow with us. So we uh, had started with that with some patients. They were quite effective also. Now, oh. patients who have undergone lippy flow treatment, and I give them a choice if they want to continue this as a, uh, we can say, uh, added uh, treatment onto this, and they found this is more effective after, uh, you know, uh, the MDD treatment. No, sir, the debate is like uh, whether like such costly treatments like lippy flow, are they really worth that cost or you mean to say that even these conventional normal heating pads can do the benefit to the patient as good with the chronic use of these? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, one treatment, if you do a proper lipid flow treatment, it will last for six months, three to six months in some patients. And uh, people have done uh, various ways to look into this. Some people do are uh, just heating uh, uh, with these devices first. If they found uh, patient effective, then they do a thermoflow treatment because they know that this is going to be effective for that patient. But whatever we have done in the RP center, uh, thankfully we have a slightly subsidized rate also, and patient have benefited. And six, uh, though it is costly, as soon as I say this cost, patient will not accept the you know, treatment as such. But once they undergo this treatment, many people, I think almost 70 to 80 percent people are very you know uh, happy with this happy. treatment. So if you have a system, yes, you should apply that. Otherwise, go for a conventional treatment. 
Sir, do you mean to say that patient who has undergone treatment with laser pulse therapy or lippy flow and uh, after uh, like the duration of their effect lasts for about six months to one year, they can follow up on uh, this uh, auto uh, microwavable uh, brooder yes. type uh, treatment? Yeah, it is. It is more helpful after that treatment. Yeah. If you have a simple, you know, uh, microwavable uh, pa the pads, Eating pads, it will yeah. be effective. But after thermal flow treatment, because now you have a fresh, you know, uh, glands and uh, your tubules are all open, so things will be more effective. That is what we found. So we have uh, experts. Mm -hmm. Two other specialities here: Dr. Balla, glaucoma, and Dr. Dadia from Squint. So, would you? What would you? Uh, uh, I, I have one. I have one question for all the experts. Uh, after the recommendation of uh, this uh, due second in two zero seventeen, has the treatment of dry eye changed in Indian circumstances? So I think T force used to. Uh, we were pretty much doing what 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 T force used to told us earlier also. Only the thing is that they have made it you know more organized, more structured. And uh, now we are, you know, following an algorithm sort of a thing that if it is mild, what would you do? Moderate, what would you do? Severe, how would you manage? So that way it has helped to organize things and to put everything into the right perspective with the, with the evidence, with literature. Maybe before that also we were doing the same thing, but we were doing it in very haphazard manner. So that is the difference. Uh, and it's it has recognized... It's put a stamp. It's put a huh? stamp. It is yeah. put a stamp. On what it, is. it has also recognized one very important entity which we did not have that perspective in a collecting form and that was the hydrogenic dry eye disease which is you know becoming more and more important now because of the drugs that we use because of the surgeries that we do so these things are there after the you know t first do i too. think what deuce two did was to make it more structured uh, unfortunately it the disease is such that there's so much overlap between these compartments that one has to go from one treatment to the other to the third uh, no, without think, necessarily compartmentalizing I, the disease. Uh, yeah, but I think there are not enough randomized control trials which tell us about the management algorithm. I mean, right. what should you do? And I think Dr. Tiktyal sir was also discussing the same thing that what should you do, you know, stage one? What should you do now? What should you do now? Something like this has to be devised based on our studies and our cases tend to be more severe than the cases which are there in the Western world. I'm sure I even say, we do I, have I say, that you know, level we, one and level two may have yeah. different uh, treatment uh, acceptances in different scenarios. So whatever, whatever we have discussed, you know, like uh, we began with uh, Vishal, he talked about dry eye clinic. And the concept is that, uh, and whatever we are discussing dues to, would apply to uh, those places where you have a dedicated clinic, where you have a you know, categorization of your patient then implement what you think and then see the outcome in general it doesn't happen like what you talked about uh, like it, if you what uh, Subhas is telling us if you talk to a general ophthalmologist he doesn't bother into all those things he'll just see the patient and bombard with whatever he has so th this is a time i think we need to have established dry eye clinics in our various uh, you know areas and the patient should be rooted from our step one to step three so that you can apply all these, you know, newer gadgets and newer modalities for your patients. I think we should have a webinar on dry eye clinics in the COVID yeah. situation. Okay. You know, with yeah. PPEs, yeah. the air conditioning, masks yeah. being worn. The we will have dry eye now. <laughs> can I put on one more question to Dr. Vishal? Uh, what is the role of vitamin D in dry eye? I think he was sort of mentioning it in his talk. So there is a question on what is the role of vitamin D? in dry eye and uh, newer medications like varnicillin which target nicotinic receptors. Vishal, any comments on that or anybody on the panel, please? Vishal, you are mute. You are mute. Okay. So vitamin D uh, uh, is, is, is basically associated with the glandular health. This is uh, an, an absolute truth regarding the how it works. It's a nuclear uh, uh, what you say, a nuclear hormone, or, or uh, this this vitamin D is working on all the glands, whether it's all the secretory glands, whether it's our mouth, whether it's our reproductive glands, whether it's our eyes. So it is seen. Maybe it's an associative thing. It has still not come up in the DUS two uh, classification uh, yet, 
uh, whether it's a mere association or it's it's actual uh, actual uh, what's the causative factor that the low vitamin D is associated with a more severe dry eye as compared to a person not having a low vitamin D. But unfortunately, in India, uh, the population that we have studied, the North Indian study I was talking about, the 21 to 40 years age, they were having a digital screen exposure more than uh, four, four hours a day. I mean, they must be having in a closed space. There are so many other factors also. In a closed space, no sunshine. You cannot make vitamin D. So everybody has a low vitamin D. So how do you associate it, associate it uh, uh, fully is still uh, not uh, uh, fully understood. The other part, unfortunately, I have not uh, read about it. So I cannot answer that. Maybe uh, other on the panels uh, can answer. No, I have another question for you, not related to dry eye. Yes, I think once upon a time we did, uh, you know, it was said that uh, vitamin D has a role to play in keratoconus. And yes. that's not there now. Yeah. So, I mean, like that. Uh, kind of association, yes. Yes. So, so I, I think in the end, uh, Nabata, the vitamin D connection will come through its role in inflammation. Uh, yeah. So, when keratoconus was thought to be an inflammatory disease, that whole mm -hmm. thing about vitamin D came in. Mm -hmm. Now, with the concept of dry eye being an inflammatory disease, the concept of, I think Rohit is working a lot with vitamin D uh, in Bangalore. And uh, uh, he's come up with uh, this pulse therapy where uh, pulse of vitamin D, if you're deficient in vitamin D, if your patient is not responding, get the D3 levels done. If they are deficient, give them a pulse of vitamin D and see the response. And now even vitamin D is supposed to be having role in the pathophysiology of COVID infection also, which has been presumed in the latest pathophysiology. So... No, no. Again, it is... No, some... Hello? Hello? And one question... Yeah, most of vitamin uneven in COVID. Food. Yeah. Vitamin D in COVID also. Okay. Yeah, th th this has also come in uh, latest uh, publication that vitamin D deficiencies. That that is one of the reasons that mortality in uh, countries like India is uh, not that it's much less. compared to the other European uh, countries and America, where the vitamin D deficiency is supposed to be much more compared. Again, uh, Jitinder, that's the inflammation connection. Because Maybe. it's the cytokine storm, storm. that is uh, creating the mortality in COVID. And if yeah. you've got a good quality or good quantum of vitamin D, then probably your inflammatory system will not get, will overreact. React. And yeah. uh, uh, will be, with the mortality rates will be lower. I There's think one these, are all, these are all conjectures. And these are all I think conjectures. they're all associations. Yeah. I wouldn't yeah. look at it as any cause and effect. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, not not cause effect. They are maybe associations yeah. only. Sorry? Uh, I knew you are going to say this only that these are your yeah, because they're not convinced. What about dry and uncomplete uneventful cataract surgery patients? Most of the patients complain of irritation and some dryness, and even literature says that some amount of dry eye occurs post cataract surgery patients okay, and it so lasts as long as three months. That is the last question. It will be answered by Professor Titial sir, who does maximum number of cataracts. <laughs> <laughs> Do you give lubricant in your patients of cataract surgery, sir? I don't think so. I, I normally don't give them as a you know uh, a treatment with package I have for all my patients. It doesn't have a lubricant, but there are patients who complain. Then we start lubricant for these patients. And if you look into uh, people publishing dry eye after cataract surgery, they say first week is a you know where patient have more dry eye. Then after four to six weeks, they start have more symptoms. I personally feel uh, uh, these are a group of patients, they already would have some sort of dryness. And we have never looked into those uh, category of patients. We never looked into their glands. We never looked into uh, screening these patients before doing surgeries. And after do we, we do surgery, everything is blamed onto the surgery. Maybe, yes, we make an incision that might cause a early breakup of tears, tear fill. We put so many uh, drops for a patient that again ca can cause ocular surface disturbance. But if you look into your patient after a you know, few months, only those patients will have sustained symptoms if they already have uh, some sort of ocular surface disease. So regularly, normal patients may not have long duration of problems. And the people who complain, they have some sort of a itching or a, some sort of a feeling that something is stuck there. So that's basically a rapid tear film breakup happening in that particular area, which may be an incision area where your epithelial uh, migration or uh, epithelial cells which are getting there may not be uh, appropriately 
as per the you know corneal surface and may cause little bit of breakup time if i stain all my patient after a, a one week or after four weeks that that is the area where i can see a early breakup happening for tfl so that's a culprit so we have to add some sort of lubricant for these patients especially after uh, decreasing the other drops because the other drops also like act like a lubricants also so i do have patient uh, requiring lubricant maybe around 50 to 60% would require a lubricant after cataract surgery also i don't know if you've seen this that one eye sometimes needs more lubricant than the other eye especially <laughs> post cataract surgery you can take over both the eyes and sometimes patient say that this side no problem and the other eye has little more issue i mean it's pretty unexplainable i don't know if you've had this kind of thing especially the I second think. eye is always a problem first eye is always okay you know they will always have that some was, uh... um, something you know Brilliantly and comprehensively happen. answered, Jeevan. Brilliantly and comprehensively answered. Can't add to that. Perfect. So uh, I would like to thank everybody today, the chairpersons, Professor Tritiyal, uh, Professor Ritu Arora, uh, Dr. Rishi Mohan, our president, Dr. Suvaj Dadia. As a uh, as a president, this was the first webinar, and uh, thank you for joining in on dry eye subject, which is again so dry. and uh, also dr balla and all the talks which were great uh, priyu should did a great job you 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 know unsorted out the whole thing which lubricate which lubricant is the best and of course vishal you are always terrific and the the, the work which is done by vanuthi moderating it uh, to the uh, perfection you know with uh, questions and pauses and everything else so thank you so much and we would also like to thank the audio visual team and also the sipla who uh, sponsored this uh, event thank, thank you, you very much thank you thank you very much thank you everybody for thanks, joining Monty. us thanks for yeah, thank you